side four. An account of some strange disturbances in Angel Street by J. Sheridan Lefanu. My cousin, Tom Ludlow, and I studied medicine together. I think he would have succeeded had he stuck to the profession, but he preferred the church, poor fellow, and died early, a sacrifice to contagion contracted in the noble discharge of his duties. For my present purpose, I say enough of his character when I mention that he was of a sedate but frank and cheerful nature, very exact in his observance of truth, and not by any means like myself, of an excitable or nervous temperament. My uncle Ludlow, Tom's father, while we were attending lectures, bought some old houses in Anger Street, one of which was unoccupied. He resided in the country, and Tom proposed that we should take up our abode in the untenanted house, so long as it should continue unlet, a move which would accomplish the double end of settling us nearer alike to our lecture rooms and to our amusements, and of relieving us from the weekly rent for our lodgings. Our furniture was very scant, and in short, our arrangements pretty nearly as simple as those of a bivouac. The front drawing room was our sitting room. I had the bedroom over it, and Tom the back bedroom on the same floor, which nothing could have induced me to occupy. The house was a very old one. It had been, I believe, newly fronted about 50 years before, but with this exception, it had nothing modern about it. The agent who bought it and looked into the titles for my uncle told me that it was sold, along with much other forfeited property, at Chichester House, I think in 1702, and had belonged to Sir Thomas Hackett, who was Lord Mayor of Dublin in James II's time. How old it was then, I can't say. But at all events, it had seen years and changes enough to have contracted all that mysterious and saddened air, at once exciting and depressing, which belongs to most old mansions. An effort had, indeed, been made to the extent of papering the drawing rooms. But somehow the paper looked raw and out of keeping, and the old woman who kept a little dirt pie of a shop in the lane, and whose daughter, a girl of two and fifty, was our solitary handmaid, coming in at sunrise and chastely receding again as soon as she had made all ready for tea in our state apartment. This woman, I say, remembered it when old Judge Horrocks, who, having earned the reputation of a particularly hanging judge, ended by hanging himself, as the coroner's jury found, over the old banisters, resided there, entertaining good company with fine venison and rare old port. In those halcyon days, the drawing rooms were hung with gilded leather and, I dare say, cut a good figure, for they were really spacious rooms. The bedrooms were wainscoted, but the front one was not gloomy, and in the coziness of antiquity quite overcame its sombre associations. But the back bedroom, this alcove, as our maid was wont to call it, had in my eyes a specially sinister and suggestive character. Tom's distant and solitary candle glimmered vainly into its darkness. The whole room was, I can't tell how, repulsive to me. Nothing could have induced me to pass a night alone in it. I had never pretended to conceal from poor Tom my superstitious weakness, and he, on the other hand, most unaffectedly ridiculed my tremors. The sceptic was, however, destined to receive a lesson. We had not been very long in occupation of our respective dormitories when I began to complain of uneasy nights and disturbed sleep. After a preliminary course of disagreeable and frightful dreams, my troubles took a definite form, and the same vision visited me at least, on an average, every second night in the week. Now this dream, nightmare, or infernal illusion, which you please, of which I was the miserable sport, was on this wise. I saw or thought I saw, with the most abominable distinctness, although at the time, in profound darkness, every article of furniture and accidental arrangement of the chamber in which I lay. This, as you know, is incidental to ordinary nightmare. Well, 
While in this clairvoyant condition, my attention invariably became, I know not why, fixed upon the windows opposite the foot of my bed. And, uniformly with the same effect, a sense of dreadful anticipation always took slow but sure possession of me. I became somehow conscious of a sort of horrid but undefined preparation going forward in some unknown quarter and by some unknown agency for my torment. And after an interval, which always seemed to me of the same length, a picture suddenly flew up to the window where it remained fixed, as if by an electrical attraction, and my discipline of horror then commenced to last perhaps for hours. The picture was the portrait of an old man in a crimson-flowered silk dressing gown, the folds of which I could now describe, with a countenance embodying a strange mixture of intellect, sensuality and power, but withal sinister and full of malignant omen. His nose was hooked like the beak of a vulture, his eyes large, grey and prominent, and lighted up with a more than mortal cruelty and coldness. These features were surmounted by a crimson velvet cap, the hair that peeped from under which was white with age, while the eyebrows retained their original blackness. Well, I remember every line, hue, and shadow of that stony countenance, and well I may. The gaze of this hellish visage was fixed upon me, and mine returned it with the inexplicable fascination of nightmare for what appeared to me to be hours of agony. At last, the cock he crew, away then flew, the fiend who had enslaved me through the awful watches of the night, and harassed and nervous, I rose to the duties of the day. I had, I can't say exactly why, but it may have been from the exquisite anguish and profound impressions of unearthly horror with which this strange phantasmagoria was associated, an insurmountable antipathy to describing the exact nature of my nightly trouble to my friend and comrade. Generally, however, I told him that I was haunted by abominable dreams, and, true to the imputed materialism of medicine, we put our heads together to dispel my horrors, not by exorcism, but by a tonic. I will do this tonic justice, and frankly admit that the accursed portrait began to intermit its visits under its influence. One night, for a wonder, I was sleeping soundly when I was roused by a step on the lobby outside my room, followed by the loud clang of what turned out to be a large brass candlestick flung with all his force by poor Tom Ludlow over the banisters and rattling with a rebound down the second flight of stairs. And, almost concurrently with this, Tom burst open my door and bounced into my room backwards in a state of extraordinary agitation. I had jumped out of bed and clutched him by the arm before I had any distinct idea of my own whereabouts. There we were, in our shirts, standing before the open door, staring through the great old banister opposite at the lobby window through which the light of a clouded moon was gleaming. What's the matter, Tom? What's the matter with you? What the devil's the matter with you, Tom? I demanded, shaking him with nervous impatience. He took a long breath before he answered me, and then it was not very coherently. Uh, it's nothing, nothing at all. Did I speak? What did I say? Where, where's the candle, Richard? It, it's dark. I, I had a candle. Yes, dark enough, I said. But what's the matter? What is it? Why don't you speak, Tom? Have you lost your wits? What is the matter? The, the matter, uh, oh, it is all over. It, it must have been a dream. Nothing at all but a dream. Don't you think so? It, it could not be anything more than a dream. Uh, of course, said I, feeling uncommonly nervous. It was a dream. I, I thought, he said, there was a man in my room, and, and I jumped out of bed and... and uh, 
Where's the candle? Well, in your room, most likely, I said. Shall I go and bring it? No. Stay here. Don't go. It, it, it's no matter. Don't. I tell you, it, it, it was all a dream. Bolt the door, Dick. I'll stay here with you. I feel nervous. Light your candle and open the window. I'm in a shocking state. Everybody knows how contagious is fear of all sorts. But more especially that particular kind of fear under which poor Tom was at that moment laboring. Don't mind telling me anything about your nonsensical dream, Tom, said I, affecting contempt. Really in a panic. Let's talk about something else. But it is quite plain that this dirty old house disagrees with us both. And hang me if I stay here any longer to be pestered with indigestion and, and, and bad nights. So we may as well look out for lodgings. Don't you think so? At once. Tom agreed, and after an interval said, I've been thinking, Richard, that it is a long time since I saw my father, and I've made up my mind to go down tomorrow and return in a day or two, and you can take rooms for us in the meantime. I fancied that this resolution, obviously the result of the vision which had so profoundly scared him, would probably vanish next morning with the damps and shadows of night. But I was mistaken. Off went Tom at peep of day to the country, having agreed that so soon as I had secured suitable lodgings, I was to recall him by letter from his visit to my Uncle Ludlow. Nearly a week elapsed before my bargain was made and my letter of recall on the wing to Tom. And in the meantime, a trifling adventure or two had occurred, which, absurd as they now appear, diminished by distance, did certainly at the time serve to whet my appetite for change. A night or two after the departure of my comrade, I was sitting by my bedroom fire, the door locked, and the ingredients of a tumbler of hot whiskey punch upon the crazy spider table. I had thrown aside my volume of anatomy and was treating myself by way of a tonic preparatory to my punch and bed to half a dozen pages of the spectator when I heard a step on the flight of stairs descending from the attics. It was two o'clock and the streets were as silent as a churchyard. There was a slow, heavy tread characterized by the emphasis and deliberation of age descending by the narrow staircase from above and what made the sound more singular it was plain that the feet which produced it were perfectly bare measuring the descent with something between a pound and a flop very ugly to hear when the step reached the foot of the stairs outside my room it seemed to stop, and I expected every moment to see my door open spontaneously and give admission to the original of my detested portrait. I was, however, relieved in a few seconds by hearing the descent renewed, just in the same manner, upon the staircase leading down to the drawing rooms, and thence, after another pause, down the next flight and so on to the hall, whence I heard no more. By the time the sound had ceased, I was wound up to a very unpleasant pitch of excitement. I listened, but there was not a stir. I screwed up my courage to a decisive experiment, opened my door, and in a stentorian voice bawled over the banisters, Who's there? There was no answer but the ringing of my own voice through the empty old house. No renewal of the movement. Nothing, in short, to give my unpleasant sensations a definite direction. Next night brought no return of my barefooted lodger. But the night following, being in my bed, somewhere I distinctly heard the old fellow again descending from the garrets. This time I had had my punch, and the morale of the garrison was consequently excellent. I jumped out of bed, clutched the poker as I passed the expiring fire, 
and in a moment was upon the lobby. The sound had ceased by this time. The dark and chill were discouraging, and guess my horror when I saw, or thought I saw, a black monster, whether in the shape of a man or a bear, I could not say, standing with its back to the wall on the lobby, facing me, with a pair of great greenish eyes shining dimly out. Now, I must be frank and confess that the cupboard which displayed our plates and cups stood just there, though at the moment I did not recollect it. At the same time, I must honestly say that making every allowance for an excited imagination, I could never satisfy myself that I was made the dupe of my own fancy in this matter. For this apparition, after one or two shiftings of shape, as if in the act of incipient transformation, began, as it seemed on second thoughts, to advance upon me in its original form. From an instinct of terror rather than of courage, I hurled the poker with all my force at its head, and to the music of a horrid crash, made my way into my room and double-locked the door. Then I heard the horrid bare feet walk down the stairs till the sound ceased in the hall. If the apparition of the night before was an ocular delusion of my fancy sporting with the dark outlines of our cupboard, and if its horrid eyes were nothing but a pair of inverted cups, I had at all events the satisfaction of having launched the poker with admirable effect and, in true fancy phrase, knocked its two daylights into one, as the fragments of my tea service testified. I did my best to gather comfort and courage from these evidences, but it would not do. And then what could I say of those horrid bare feet and the regular tramp, 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 which measured the distance of the entire staircase through the solitude of my haunted dwelling, and at an hour when no good influence was stirring. I dreaded the approach of night. It came, ushered ominously in, with a thunderstorm and dull torrents of depressing rain. I made myself as snug as I could. I lighted two candles instead of one. I forswore bed and held myself in readiness for a sally, candle in hand. I was resolved to see the being, if visible at all, who troubled the nightly stillness of my mansion. I was fidgety and nervous and tried in vain to interest myself with my books. I walked up and down my room, whistling in turn martial and hilarious music and listening ever and anon for the dreaded noise. Silence, meanwhile, grew more silent and darkness darker. There was nothing but the sound of a rising wind which had succeeded the thunderstorm that had travelled over the Dublin mountains quite out of hearing. In the middle of this great city, I began to feel alone with nature. My courage was ebbing. Punch, however, which makes beasts of so many, made a man of me again, just in time to hear with tolerable nerve and firmness the lumpy, flabby, naked feet deliberately descending the stairs again. I took a candle, not without a tremor. The steps continued. I confess I hesitated for some seconds at the door before I took heart of grace and opened it. When I peeped out, the lobby was perfectly empty. There was no monster standing on the staircase. And as the detested sound ceased, I was reassured enough to venture forward nearly to the banisters. Horror of horrors! Within a stair or two beneath the spot where I stood, the unearthly tread smote the floor. My eye caught something in motion. It was about the size of Goliath's foot. It was grey, heavy, and flapped with a dead weight from one step to another. As I am alive, it was the most monstrous grey rat I ever beheld 
or imagined. I went well nigh out of my wits when I beheld this rat. For, laugh at me as you may, it fixed upon me, I thought, a perfectly human expression of malice. And, as it shuffled about and looked up into my face almost from between my feet, I saw I could swear it. I felt it then and know it now. The infernal gaze of the accursed countenance of my old friend in the portrait transfused into the visage of the bloated vermin before me. I bounced into my room again with a feeling of loathing and locked and bolted my door. Damn him or it. Curse the portrait and its original. I felt in my soul that the rat, yes, the rat, the rat I had just seen was that evil being in masquerade and rambling through the house upon some infernal night lark. Next morning, I was early trudging through the miry streets and among other transactions, posted a peremptory note recalling Tom. On my return, however, I found a note from my absent chum announcing his intended return next day. I was doubly rejoiced at this because I'd succeeded in getting rooms and because the change of scene and return of my comrade were rendered specially pleasant by the last night's half ridiculous, half horrible adventure. I slept extemporaneously in my new quarters in Digg Street that night and next morning returned for breakfast to the haunted mansion where I was certain Tom would call immediately on his arrival. I was quite right. He came, and almost his first question referred to the primary object of our change of residence. Thank God, he said with genuine fervour on hearing that all was arranged. On your account, I'm delighted. As to myself, I assure you that no earthly consideration could have induced me ever again to pass a night in this disastrous old house. Oh, confound the house, I ejaculated. We have not had a pleasant hour since we came to live here. And so I went on and related, incidentally, my adventure with the plethoric old rat. Oh, well, if that were all, said my cousin, affecting to make light of the matter, I don't think I should have minded it very much. Ah, but it's eyes. It's countenance, my dear Tom, urged I. If you had seen that, you would have felt it might be anything but what it seemed. I'm inclined to think that the best conjurer in such a case would have been an able-bodied cat, he said with a provoking chuckle. But let us hear your own adventure, I said tartly. At this challenge, he looked uneasily round him. I had poked up a very unpleasant recollection. You shall hear it, Dick. I'll tell it to you, he said. Big gad, sir. I would feel quite queer, though, telling it here, though we are too strong a body for ghosts to meddle with just now. Though he spoke this like a joke, I think it was serious calculation. Our Hebe was in a corner of the room, packing our cracked Delft tea and dinner services in a basket. She soon suspended operations and with mouth and eyes wide open, became an absorbed listener. I saw it three times, Dick, said Tom. Three distinct times. And I'm perfectly certain it meant me some infernal harm. The first night of this hateful disturbance, I was lying in the attitude of sleep in that lumbering old bed. I hate to think of it. I was really wide awake, though I'd put out my candle and was lying as quietly as if I'd been asleep. And although accidentally restless, my thoughts were running in a cheerful and agreeable channel. I think it must have been two o'clock at least when I thought I heard a sound in that, that odious dark recess of the far end of the bedroom. It was as if someone was drawing a piece of cord slowly along the floor, lifting it up and dropping it softly down again in coils. 
I sat up once or twice in my bed, but could see nothing. So I concluded it must be mice in the wainscot. While lying in this state, strange to say, without at first a suspicion of anything supernatural, on a sudden, I saw an old man, rather stout and square, in a sort of roan red dressing gown, and with a black cap on his head, moving stiffly and slowly in a diagonal direction from the recess across the floor of the bedroom, passing my bed at the foot and entering the lumber closet at the left. He had something under his arm. His head hung a little at one side. Oh, merciful God, when I saw his face, that awful countenance, which living or dying I never can forget, disclosed what he was. Without turning to the right or the left, he passed beside me and entered the closet by the bed's head. For hours after it had disappeared, I was too terrified and weak to move. As soon as daylight came, I took courage and examined the room, and especially the course which the frightful intruder had seemed to take. But there was not a vestige to indicate anybody's having passed there. I now began to recover a little. I was fagged and exhausted, and at last, overpowered by a feverish sleep, I came down late. And finding you out of spirits on account of your dreams about the portrait, whose original I am now certain disclosed himself to me, I did not care to talk about the infernal vision. It required some nerve, I can tell you, to go to my haunted chamber next night and lie down quietly in the same bed, continued Tom. I did so with a degree of trepidation, which, I'm not ashamed to say, a very little matter would have sufficed to stimulate to downright panic. This night, however, passed off quietly enough. It was also the next, and so did two or three more. I grew more confident and began to fancy that I believed in the theories of spectral illusions which I had at first vainly tried to impose on my convictions. The apparition had been, indeed, altogether anomalous. It had crossed the room without any recognition of my presence. I had not disturbed it, and it had no mission to me. What, then, was the imaginable use of its crossing the room in a visible shape at all? Of course, it might have been in the closet instead of going there as easily as it had introduced itself into the recess without entering the chamber in a shape discernible by the senses. Besides, how the deuce had I seen it? It was a dark night. I had no candle. There was no fire. And yet I saw it distinctly. A cataleptic dream would explain it all. And I was determined that a dream it should be. One of the most remarkable phenomena connected with the practice of mendacity is the vast number of deliberate lies we tell ourselves, whom, of all persons, we can least expect to deceive. In all this, I need hardly tell you, Dick, I was simply lying to myself and did not believe one word of the wretched humbug. Yet I went on, hoping to win myself over at last to a comfortable skepticism about the ghost. He had not appeared a second time. Well, that certainly was a comfort. And what, after all, did I care for him and his queer old toggery and strange looks? Not a fig. I was nothing the worse for having seen him, and a good story the better. So I tumbled into bed and went fast asleep. From this deep slumber, I awoke with a start. I knew I had had a horrible dream but what it was I could not remember. My heart was thumping furiously. I felt bewildered and feverish. I sat up in the bed. A broad flood of moonlight came in through the curtainless window. Everything was as I had last seen it, and I could hear a pleasant fellow singing on his way home, the popular comic ditty called Murphy Delaney. Taking advantage of this diversion, 
I lay down again and, closing my eyes, did my best to think of nothing else but the song, which was every moment growing fainter in the distance. "'Twas Murphy Delaney, so funny and frisky, stepped into a shebeen shop to get his skin full. He reeled out again pretty well lined with whiskey, as fresh as a shamrock, as blind as a bull. As his music died away, I myself sank into a doze. Somehow, the song had got into my head, and I went meandering on through the adventures of my respectable fellow countrymen, who, on emerging from the shebeen shop, fell into a river from which he was fished up to be sat upon by a coroner's jury, who, having learned from a horse doctor that he was dead as a doornail, so there was an end, returned their verdict accordingly, just as he returned to his senses, when an angry altercation and a pitched battle between the body and the coroner winds up the lay with due spirit and pleasantry. Through this ballad, I continued with a weary monotony to plod, down to the very last line in my uncomfortable half-sleep, for how long, I can't conjecture. I found myself at last, however, muttering, dead as a doornail, so there was an end. And something like another voice within me seemed to say very faintly but sharply, dead, 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 and may the Lord have mercy on your soul. And instantaneously I was wide awake and staring right before me from the pillow. Now, will you believe it, Dick? I saw the same accursed figure standing full front and gazing at me with its stony and fiendish countenance, not two yards from the bedside. Tom stopped here and wiped the perspiration from his face. I felt very queer. The girl was as pale as Tom, and assembled as we were in the very scene of these adventures, we were all, I dare say, equally grateful for the clear daylight and the resuming bustle out of doors. For about three seconds only, I saw it plainly, continued Tom. Then it grew indistinct, but for a long time, there was something like a column of dark vapour where it had been standing between me and the wall, and I felt sure that he was still there. After a good while, this appearance went too. I took my clothes downstairs to the hall and dressed there, with the door half open, then went out into the street and walked about the town till morning when I came back in a miserable state of nervousness and exhaustion. I was such a fool, Dick, as to be ashamed to tell you how I came to be so upset. I thought you would laugh at me, especially as I'd always talked philosophy and treated your ghosts with contempt. Now, Dick, you will hardly believe me when I assure you that for many nights after this last experience, I did not go to my room at all. I used to sit up in the drawing room after you'd gone up to your bed, and then steal down softly to the hall door, let myself out, and sit in the Robin Hood tavern until the last guest went off. And then I got through the night like a sentry, pacing the streets till morning. For more than a week, I never slept in bed. I sometimes had a snooze on a form in the Robin Hood, and sometimes a nap in a chair during the day, but regular sleep I had absolutely none. I was quite resolved that we should get into another house. But I could not bring myself to tell you the reason, and I somehow put it off from day to day. One afternoon, I determined to enjoy an hour's sleep upon your bed. I hated mine, so that I had never, except in a stealthy visit every day to unmake it, lest Martha should discover the secret of my nightly absence, entered the ill-omened chamber. As ill luck would have it, you had locked your bedroom and taken away the key. I went into my own to unsettle the bedclothes as usual and give the bed the appearance of having been slept in. Now, a variety of circumstances occurred to bring about the dreadful scene through which I was that night to pass. In the first place, I was literally overpowered with fatigue and longing for sleep. In the next place, 
The effect of this extreme exhaustion upon my nerves resembled that of a narcotic and rendered me less susceptible than perhaps I should in any other condition have been of the exciting fears which had become habitual to me. But then again, a little bit of the window was open. A pleasant freshness pervaded the room. And to crown all, the cheerful sun was making the room quite pleasant. What was to prevent my enjoying an hour's nap here? The whole air was resonant with a cheerful hum of life, and the broad, matter-of-fact light of day filled every corner of the room. I yielded, stifling my qualms, to the almost overpowering temptation, and merely throwing off my coat and loosening my cravat, I lay down, limiting myself to half an hour's doze in the unwanted enjoyment of a feather bed, a coverlet, and a bolster. It was horribly insidious, and the demon, no doubt, marked my infatuated preparations. Doped that I was, I fancied, with mind and body worn out for want of sleep, and an arrear of a full week's rest to my credit, that such measure as half an hour's sleep in such a situation was possible. My sleep was deathlike. Without a start or fearful sensation of any kind, I waked gently, but completely. It was, as you have good reason to remember, about two o'clock. There was a figure seated in that lumbering old sofa chair near the fireplace. Its back was rather towards me, but I could not be mistaken. It turned slowly round, and merciful heavens, there was the stony face with its infernal lineaments gloating on me. There was now no doubt as to its consciousness of my presence and the hellish malice with which it was animated, for it arose and drew close to the bedside. There was a rope about its neck, and the other end, coiled up, it held stiffly in its hand. I was transfixed by the gaze of this tremendous phantom. He came close to the bed and appeared on the point of mounting upon it. The next instant, I was upon the floor at the far side and in a moment more upon the lobby. But the phantom was there before me. It was standing near the banisters, stooping a little, and with one end of the rope round its own neck, was poising a noose at the other, as if to throw over mine. I saw and remember nothing more until I found myself in your room. I, I had a wonderful escape, Dick. There's no disputing that. An escape for which, while I live, I shall bless the mercy of heaven. Dick, Dick, a shadow has passed over me. A chill has crossed my blood and marrow, and I will never be the same again. Never, Dick. Never. Our handmaid, a mature girl of two and fifty, as I have said, stayed her hand as Tom's story proceeded, and my little and little drew near to us with open mouth and her brows contracted over her little beady black eyes, till, stealing a glance over her shoulder now and then, she established herself close behind us. It's often I heard tell of it, she said now. But I never believed it rightly till now, though indeed why should not I? Does not my mother down there in the lane know queer stories, God bless us, beyond telling about it? But she ought not to have slept in the back bedroom. She was loath to let me be going in and out of that room even in the daytime, let alone for any Christian to spend the night in it. Sure, she says it was his own bedroom. Whose own bedroom? he asked in a breath. Why, his. The old judge's. Judge Horrocks, to be sure, God rest his soul. And she looked fearfully round. Amen, I muttered. But uh, did he... Die there? Die there? No, not quite there, she said. 
Sure, was it not over the banisters he hung himself? The old sinner, God be merciful to us all. And was not it in the alcove they found the handles of the skipping rope cut off? And the knife where he was settling the cord, God bless us, to hang himself with? It was his housekeeper's daughter owned the rope, my mother often told me. And the child never throve after, and used to be starting up out of her sleep and screeching in the night time with dreams and frights than commoner. And they said how it was the spirit of the old judge that was tormenting her. And she used to be roaring and yelling out to hold back the big old fellow with the crooked neck. And then she'd screech, Oh, the master, the master, he's stamping at me and beckoning to me. Mother, darling, don't let me go. And so the poor creature died at last. And the doctors said it was water on the brain. But it was all they could say. Oh, how long ago was all this, I asked. Oh, then, how would I know? she answered. But it must be a wonderful long time ago, for the housekeeper was an old woman with a pipe in her mouth and not a tooth left, and better nor eighty years old when my mother was first married. And they said she was a real, buxom, fine-dressed woman when the old judge came to his end. And indeed, my mother's not far from eighty years old herself this day. And what made it worse for the unnatural old villain, God rest his soul, to frighten the little girl out of the world the way he did was what was mostly thought and believed by everyone. My mother says how the poor little creature was his own child. For he was by all accounts an old villain every way and the hanginest judge that ever was known in Ireland's ground. From what you said about the danger of sleeping in that bedroom, said I, I suppose there were stories about the ghost having appeared there to others. Well, there was things said, queer things, surely, she answered, as it seemed with some reluctance. And why would not there? Sure, was it not up in that same room he slept for more than twenty years? And was it not in the alcove he got the rope ready that done his own business at last, the way he'd done many a better man's in his lifetime? And was not the body lying in the same bed after death, and put in the coffin there, too, and carried out to his grave from it in Pethys churchyard, after the coroner was done. But there was queer stories. My mother has them all. No one ever had luck in the house. There was always cross accidents, sudden deaths, and short times in it. The first that took it was family, oh, I forget their name, but at any rate, there was two young ladies and their papa. He was about sixty, and a stout, healthy gentleman as you'd wish to see at that age. Well, he slept in that unlucky back bedroom. And, God between us and harm, sure enough, he was found dead one morning, half out of the bed, with his head as black as a slow and swelled like a puddin', hanging down near the floor. It was a fit, they said. He was as dead as a mackerel, and so he could not say what it was. But the old people was all sure that it was nothing at all but the old judge, God bless us, that frightened him out of his senses and his life together. Some time after, there was a rich old maiden lady took the house. I don't know which room she slept in, but she lived alone. And at any rate one morning, the servants going down early to the work found her sitting on the passage stairs, shivering and talking to herself, quite mad. And never a word more could any of them or their friends get from her ever afterwards, but don't ask me to go, for I promised to wait for him. They never made out from her who it was she meant by him. But of course those that knew all about the old house were at no loss for the meaning of all that happened to her. Then afterwards, when the house was let out in lodgings, there was Mickey Byrne that took the same room with his wife and three little children. And sure, I heard Mrs. Byrne myself telling how the children used to be lifted up in the bed at night. She could not see by what means. And how they were starting and screeching every hour, just all as one as the housekeeper's little girl that died, till at last one night, poor Mickey had a drop in him, 
with the way he used now and again. And what do you think? In the middle of the night, he thought he heard a noise on the stairs, and being in liquor, nothing less would it do him, but out he must go himself to see what was wrong. But after that, all she ever heard of him was himself saying, Oh, God! And a tumble that shook the very house. There, sure enough, he was lying on the lower stairs under the lobby, with his neck smashed double under him, where he was flung over the banisters. Then the handmaiden added, I'll go down the lane and send Joe Gavvy to pack up the rest of the Tathins and bring all the things across to your new lodgings. And so we all sallied out together, each of us breathing more freely, I've no doubt, as we crossed that ill-omened threshold for the last time. This audiobook was produced and published by Penguin Books Limited.